it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to our, our headline speaker for the night, Dr. Rob Davies. Uh, he is a highly experienced individual uh, specializing in, in spatial data managing uh, management, focusing on GIS analysis for biodiversity conservation and sustainable development. With over 20 years of experience in Africa and now Europe, he currently has his own successful GIS consulting uh, consultancy called Habitat Info. He's worked with renowned international organizations such as USAID and the World Bank uh, and DFID. Uh, in 20, 2012, he launched the African Raptor Data Bank, uh, which is a citizen science project that aims to assess conservation statuses of raptors, uh, raptors and their habitats across Africa. This project now holds over 63,000 records uh, and continues to grow with the help of the African Raptor Observation App. Rob has directed two conservation NGOs and possesses specialized knowledge in various areas, including birds of prey and arid ecosystems. He remains dedicated to compiling new Africa-wide spatial data sets to support conservation and sustainability in the face of population and climate change. It is my absolute pleasure, a pleasure and honor to hand you over to Dr. Rob Davies. Rob, over to you. Thank you very much. That was one of the most comprehensive introductions I've ever <laughs> had. I've forgotten most of those things I did. So uh, yeah, thank you for reminding me some of them. But it's a great pleasure to be talking to you Raptor enthusiasts today. And uh, yeah, I'm going to share my screen to give you a PowerPoint on uh, Raptor habitats in Africa. So we'll just kick off with this and I'll start the uh, slideshow. So yeah, this, this evening, really, I wanted to chat about a project which began as the African Raptor Data Bank, as Carlen has said in 2012, but has evolved into the global project GRIN. Um, so, yeah, there are lots of people who've helped along the way. Um, I'll try and mention some of them as we go through the talk. But, uh, yeah, it's just to outline a bit of history of the project and how we're trying to get a better knowledge of African habitats. I thought I'd kick off, really, talking about a raptor. You all, you all know raptors well, I'm sure, a bird that I really enjoy. Uh, the Vera's eagle. I studied them for years. And uh, it's a phenomenal raptor, smaller than a golden eagle. But look at those feet, 20% larger foot grasp than a golden eagle for dealing with dassies, which, as many of you will know, are tough customers. So uh, the thing about raptors, they're predators, but their main advantage is they fly, um, unlike a lot of other predators. So it means with their fantastic vision that they can spot prey at kilometers away and they can cover the ground uh, within, yeah, they can travel at sort of 10 times the speed of a mammal. So birds of prey, uh, some of them do catch their food in the air, some of them catch their food in the water. You've heard all about ospreys and fish eagles and so on. Um, but I'm gonna talk about birds of prey that generally catch their food on the ground. Most of them do. And uh, the black eagle is no exception. Uh, these aren't dassies. These are dassy rats, which inhabit the Richtersfeld. They're a squirrel family. But the consequence of having all these birds of prey around, which are such effective predators of mammals, is that they, <clears throat> every mammal, of a certain size, up to the uh, size of a hyrax and larger, needs to have some form of refuge. And, uh, and so where they live is determined by that refuge. So in the case of dassies and dassie rats, it's the rock crevices. Um, but in many other parts of the world, it's the vegetation. And uh, birds of prey <coughs> vary in their vegetation types that they inhabit. We're going to be talking about habitats. So Charles Darwin describes that habitat as the locality in which a plant or animal 
naturally lives, i.e. a species. But many people use the term of habitat in a broader sense uh, as a biotope or a large vegetation type that occurs across the whole of a continent. Birds of prey in Africa inhabit extremes of habitat from deserts, as you can see on this slide, through to dense forests. And uh, obviously there's a different amount of cover there. There's also a different amount of food, of, of prey. But you can see here, top left of that slide, a pair of lapid-faced vultures on a sand dune uh, in the Namib Desert at Sossusvle. And these solitary scavengers are quite effective at inhabiting a total desert. But a desert is not an ideal habitat because generally speaking, there's so little food. Contrast that with complete forest. So this is Kakum National Park, the wonderful canopy walkway where you can walk around with the birds and the animals. And this is rainforest in Africa. It's at the other end of the extreme where you've got really dense cover. And raptors inhabit that, like Cassin's eagle and uh, the chestnut flanked sparrowhawk, shown left. Wonderful adaptations with those beautiful big eyes for catching prey in dense forest. But dense forest is also not the ideal habitat for a bird of prey because it's so thick with vegetation, often they can't catch their prey. That's a distribution map of the chestnut flanked sparrowhawk, just shows the Congo Basin where they live. And uh, it's a rather unusual distribution type. Now, we tend to think of these habitats as really fixed with time, but they're not. They've changed through evolutionary time. This is a wonderful graphic from a hero of mine, Jonathan Kingdon, uh, and his book, Island Africa, that shows how the Namib Desert has expanded at times and linked up with the Somali Desert, and this is called the Arid Corridor, that effectively splits off the forested areas of Africa every now and then. So a consequence of that is you're gonna get birds of prey that are adapted to these forest patches. If you look, step away from the desert into the Karoo, my favorite part of Africa, you get a covering of, of vegetation. These are the sort of dwarf shrublands that you can see around the Nuverfeldberg. Um, <clears throat> and it's a habitat that affords more food and it's still quite open for a raptor to catch its food. So we get specialists there like the, the wonderful Blaufalk, uh, the pale chanting goshawk, a uh, really beautiful bird of prey. It's got these exquisite long legs which can stab in and out of those uh, little shrubs and pull out an agama like the one you've seen here. So pale chanting goshawk, Kalahari Karoo. There's another one up in the Horn of Africa called the Eastern Chanting Goshawk. And quite a few birds of prey and other animals show these twin distributions. So this is pygmy falcon, and you've got pygmy falcon down in the Kalahari there and pygmy falcon up in the Horn of Africa. There are dictics that show the same distributions and it's evidence of this arid corridor that once connected uh, these different parts of Africa. So those are the more deserted areas. The other, quite an open habitat that stretches across the whole of Africa really is grasslands. And showing here the annual grasses in the pro Namib. So this is after good rains, uh, when there was actually about 400 mils of rain when I went up there. And all the annual grasses <clears throat> are just sprouted. And it was amazing to see the raptors move in. But it's important to realize that this is a temporary habitat uh, and you've got to wait for the rodents to build up. And then you get uh, real grass and specialists. And I'm thinking here of the kestrels. Uh, this is a rock kestrel. Common, uh, the uh, greater kestrel also is a great grassland special specialist. And with the kestrels, one of their adaptations is this big, wonderful tail that they've got that helps them hover. And when they're hovering effectively, they're creating their own perch because in these really empty grasslands, there are a few trees, um, there are a few perches and few nest sites. Um, 
Kestrels also, unlike other falcons, catch most of their prey on the ground. So the tail is another adaptation that helps them break uh, just before impact when they're taking food off, uh, off a substrate like that. A favorite place of mine is the Kalahari. And uh, this was an extraordinary event that I witnessed in 1998. I was at Kanahuas waterhole in the park. And over one midday period, I counted 29 secretary birds, six adult battlers, 10 immature battlers, six tawny eagles, one white-backed vulture, one jackal buzzard, one young male Montague's harrier, three black harriers, one juvenile gay bar goshawk, one redneck falcon, five lana falcons, and a booted eagle, all around one tree over one midday period. So what is it about this part of Africa that is so special uh, for, for raptors? And you're seeing here grassland specialist, the secretary bird, uh, really well adapted with its long legs for catching food in the grass. Um, but you're seeing them around a tree and in the Kalahari being an arid savanna, you've got trees coming in and trees are really important not just as hunting perches, but also as nest sites, safe nest sites. So that's the distribution map of the secretary bird. And you can see this pattern. And if you look at raptor field guides and many other field guides of birds in Africa, you will see this pattern recurring again and again. Secretary bird extending quite far into the desert regions, not able to go into the dense forest. Rather similar is the battler eagle, same pattern, but here the battler is moving a bit further into the woodlands and uh, is not going into the true deserts. So the battler inhabits what people refer to as miles and miles of bloody Africa. Um, and they're really talking about these amazing savannas. So you've got the mix of grassland uh, with trees and this large, large vegetation type extends around the whole of Africa. The battler is superbly adapted to finding its food. Um, so it, it does a, its own unique sort of dynamic soaring at low altitude. It bounces off the thermals really. And they're wonderful to watch uh, as you know. But I think this is possibly the best explanation of why Africa is the best place in the world for raptors. Because if you look at this map and think about it, Africa is the only continent which is situated right bang on the equator. So it's got huge areas of savanna, both north and south of the equator. And um, <clears throat> as it tilts north and south during the seasons, so the rains move. And uh, it's a very favorable environment also for birds outside Africa to come and winter. But it's only in Africa, if you overlay all the distribution maps like we did for the Peregrine Fund here, that you get more than 70 species of raptor occurring at any one location. And you can see the grasslands of Kenya and Tanzania, Ethiopia coming out in this color um, over 70 species of raptors, really extraordinary, and not matched anywhere else on the planet. So some birds, as I mentioned, migrate into Africa. Uh, these are the amazing satellite tracks of Egyptian vultures as they move uh, in and out of Africa. So uh, they might breed up in the northern parts, but mainly they're, they're wintering, they're coming across a lot traveled down through Spain, uh, not shown on that map, uh, but they're using this favorable environment. And of course, uh, their use of habitats is different really because they're not needing a habitat in which to breed um, further south. They just need to find their food and a safe roost and so on. Besides these sort of really broad vegetation types that go across the whole of the continent, you've also got raptor habitats that crisscross all of these. And uh, rivers, lakes, waterways are one. Uh, the fish eagle and the osprey is found there. 
And then surrounding the waterways, you get the marshland. And these marshy vegetation types are inhabited by the harriers, of course, this African marsh. And uh, with these harriers, their adaptation is their low wing loading that enables them to fly really slowly and just quarter at low altitude over this dense vegetation uh, to drop in with their log long legs and catch prey and also build their nests. So those are the marshy areas. Um, one of the things we've been doing is modeling these habitats to try and understand what are the environmental factors that these birds are picking up. And this is one of our early models uh, that I got quite excited about because it showed such a good fit to the sightings of this bird. And it showed a very strong relationship to distance from freshwater and also precipitation. You might think it's a fish eagle or something, but actually it was the bat hawk. Um, and the bat hawk, of course, is dependent on its food and the bats presumably are that much more numerous around the waterways uh, where the insect prey of the bats is most numerous. Um, so this habitat modeling gives us a little bit more understanding of what it is these birds need and what they're looking for. We have a habitat too, as people, and uh, this is my best representation really of the human habitat in Africa. It just shows the green areas, the cropland, uh, and in the brown areas, the livestock, uh, nomadic livestock and resident livestock areas. So you can see that uh, as humans, we also follow the similar pattern around uh, the continent. Um, so there's going to be conflict, but certain raptors have adapted really well uh, to living alongside us. Long-crested eagles and black shoulder kites are superb at inhabiting these areas. And then in the urban areas, you've got peregrines occupying what are effectively cliffs, artificial cliffs in the form of buildings and nesting and feeding on pigeons. So some birds of prey adapt well to us, some don't. Not a great picture, uh, Ranamafana in uh, Madagascar. I just wanted to mention island species. Island species of raptors and many other wildlife face all the conservation problems that the continental um, species face, but they're amplified about 10 times because they're starting from a very restricted geographic area. And then the destruction of forests is normally really, really high uh, on our offshore islands. So this is Madagascar, that's the egg of the elephant bird. Uh, which went extinct, and uh, distribution map of the Madagascar buzzard, which um, obviously is starting uh, from a disadvantage, it's restricted to that area. There's another habitat that crisscrosses all of the vegetation types as well, and that's mountains and rocky outcrops and crances and copies. Uh, this is the Drakensberg and uh, in South Africa, and it's inhabited by the wonderful Vera's eagle. Um, Vera's eagles have this amazing ability of flying really close to the rocks. They hunt an, as a pair. This helps them to catch their prey. They also have quite an unusual wing shape uh, for an eagle with this very high aspect ratio. It's a thin wing when it's held back like that. And that's an adaptation for flying in the in the lift uh, off the mountain slopes. So I became quite absorbed mapping out all the territories of the birds in the Karoo National Park at Beaufort West, where they all defended very equal amounts of rocky outcrop, which is where the hyrax lived. Uh, this was Samburu, the young eagle that I hand raised, and he came from the Michalisberg. Um, and uh, that was a wonderful experience, learning all about uh, black eagles through a black eagle's eyes. Um, but when I did that study, it was sort of 1980s, late 1980s, and there was no GPS. And I was really battling. I was working off aerial photos and maps. 
And what we've seen over the decades since then is this arrival of the mapping technology. And that's really when I got into the mapping uh, through the Eagles. Um, but now we can download all these amazing data sets. This is the shuttle radar, uh, digital elevation model. And what it means is that we now have these data sets at uh, a scale of resolution, which is biologically meaningful for an individual pair of eagles or hawks or falcons. But we've got that across the whole of their range. So all along, uh, I've been trying to think, how can we use this mapping? How can we use these technologies to improve what we know about the birds and, and how it can help conserve them. And so we started this project, the African Raptor Data Bank. And uh, there are lots of reasons why raptors are so good a subject for this. I won't go into all of them, but suffice it to just say and quote, in the words of great our, our great Ian Newton, an abundance and diversity of raptors invariably signals a largely undisturbed ecosystem, supporting an abundance of other wildlife. Um, he always puts it really, really well. And um, Ian, uh, we owe a lot to uh, the marvelous book he wrote on population ecology of raptors. There were so many gems in there. Um, the understanding that really raptors are basically needing food and nest sites. Um, once they've got that, the population, um, is is uh, is going to reach its natural density. Uh, the other gem that came from Ian in this book is this relationship between female body mass and uh, the area of the home range. And this is what we've used in the atlasing uh, to actually establish how many pairs might exist in the space that these birds have. So there have been lots of others involved. Uh, another great inspiration uh, was Leslie Brown. And Leslie Brown, from his book on African raptors in the 50s, I think, um, well, that's when he started his work. Uh, amazing, really, that he was looking at these raptors and trying to place them in their different habitat types, as you see from this table. And, and I also wanted to mention, um, great mentors of mine, Alan and Meg Kemp, who've written the book on uh, birds of prey of Africa and associated islands. And Alan and, and Meg, we had many discussions over mapping these distributions of the birds. And Alan would always say, what we need is not just a simple map, but we need a grayscale to show, you know, where these birds are most dense. And that's really what we've been trying to do with the ARDB. Uh, but it's it's been a, a big project with lots of people helping, most notably Manir right at the beginning, Manir Varani and Darcy Ogada from the Peregrine Fund, <clears throat> who coordinated in East Africa. Manir started up the um, Raptor List Server, which was a great point of focus for so many of us uh, that were interested in birds of prey. Andre Bota in Southern Africa. Andre single-handedly has contributed 25% of the records in the ARDB and now Grin. And then in West Africa, uh, three characters, Ralph Beige and Jos Broer and Clyde Barlow have been wonderful at gathering data from there. And in the North, uh, Hishem Azavzaf from Tunisia, and more recently, Corinne Kendall has come in and helped us with the spectacular movement data of the vultures. So very much a big team effort. And I also wanted to mention Simon, because uh, Simon is a great inspiration to so many of us. And uh, about 10 years ago or so, Simon and Leila, his great friend, who's a wonderful photographer, uh, were doing a Trans-Africa Raptor Road Count. And I said, Simon, you can't do a Trans-Africa Raptor Road Count unless you go to the Kalahari. And uh, told him exactly where he needed to go. And uh, they arranged it all. And I said, you can't go to the Kalahari unless I can join you there. Um, and I had a week and a half with them. And uh, we also 
had this wonderful creature with us for a few days. So a great friend of mine, Anne Raza, specialist in mongooses, has a, a ranch, had a ranch just outside the Kalahari. And Anne loaned us her tame meerkat for the day, Fizzle. So uh, Fizzle sat on the front and he spotted all the lappet face vultures uh, really effectively. And, uh, and then I had this little eye patch that I was recording all the data as we went along. And <clears throat> I, uh, I have to say, I was a bit nerdy at that stage. I was very into my gadgets and all that stuff. And I couldn't understand why other people weren't into the same thing. Um, but I couldn't get everybody to get an IPAC and record raptors across Africa. And it took another couple of years. Um, and it, it this at this stage, I set up business back here in Wales uh, from this barn. Uh, We've got the name Habitat Info. It's it's very, very much revolved around mapping the habitats of wildlife and people. Um, and then lots of people have been involved and in helping us. Uh, and particularly Andrew Rayner, who's a programmer in Cardiff, good friend of mine. And Andrew loves phones. And what happened was all of a sudden, people were walking around with the technology that we needed in their pockets. Uh, so it was just a matter of adapting the phone uh, to get everybody using uh, the GPS and so on. Another great character who's been a tremendous help is Simon Trice. And Simon just fixes things uh, in, in Habitat Info. He's, he's a great fixer, um, but he does a lot of the work behind the scenes on the databases. So this is the app. Um, if you haven't got it, I hope you will look for it. Um, but uh, in the beginning, it was uh, very much Africa based. And we really focused on the uh, survey modes uh, by hot air balloon or however you wanted to do it. Um, it's very important uh, to be careful with this app. Don't go driving and recording raptors while you're driving. It's got to be used by a passenger or you've got to pull off the road. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it's, you can record weather conditions for your survey. It monitors where you go. We've also got a dictaphone mode that makes it safe. You just tap on the screen and you can talk into the phone what you've seen. Um, so uh, what Andrew did is he helped us improve the resolution of the data. So you can actually point the phone at the target and enter a offset uh, and it will plot uh, with great accuracy where the bird is. And we needed this because we wanted to place them in the habitat models, which have become really accurate. I won't go too far into the screen. It's got three, uh, three main screens in the app. Um, but uh, let's talk a little bit about the data. So this is the ARDB coverage. The blue shows historic records, orange current records. <clears throat> and then in 2018, I presented the data to the Peregrine Fund who have supported it from the start. And we've also had a lot of support from Esri, the software manufacturers. Um, but I said to the Peregrine Fund how difficult it was getting the project off the ground uh, studying raptors across the whole of Africa. Everybody said it couldn't be done. And the director of the Peregrine Fund at the time said, oh yeah, when people tell us it can't be done, that's like a green light for us at the Peregrine Fund. Why stop at Africa? Let's go global. So this is what happened in 2018. We developed the app a bit more to record uh, breeding productivity at nest sites. Uh, hunting behavior so it's a little bit more slick now and it's gone global so we've got a global species list and we've got subspecies down to subspecies level so lots of resolution and we've had it translated into five languages recently uh, so the database has grown the number of users has doubled and it's just beginning to spread out uh, we're developing a Philippines language at the moment. And um, we've also developed the website so you can log on and uh, look at your detailed data. 
Um, you will find buffers around your nest records, which give the approximate home range based on their, their body mass. Uh, and we've also developed it for rehab birds, uh, injured birds that come into these bird of prey centers. And at first I thought it's not gonna be a lot of data, but we mobilized all the data from one raptor center in North Carolina, and there were 30,000 records, many of which are birds that have successfully gone back to the wild. So yeah, we've, we've grown the database. Uh, this is a female peregrine, you can record the histories, the vet reports, the photographs, the x-rays. Uh, it's a communal database of knowledge on birds of prey across the world. So I hope it interests you. It's quite easy. It's a free app and it's quite easy to use. But at the end of the day, we're modeling the species. We want to get at their conservation status. This is the Marshall Eagle historic and current distribution. You can subtract one from the other and work out where we've lost the birds from. And this corresponds very closely to the, those brown areas on the human habitat map, the livestock areas. That's where we're, we're losing our Marshall Eagles. <clears throat> this is white-headed vulture. And you can see the historic light blue range all over Africa. And now today in dark blue, very much confined to our protected areas. So I think it was probably the best outcome of the ARTB is what we did for the vultures because the vultures, are uh, we've got such concern about them at the moment with their declines. And I was worried that conservationists would just throw up their arms and think, you know, what could we do? They're being poisoned all over Africa. Africa is such a huge place. So what we did with the data is we extracted the strongholds of the vultures, the areas shown on the right there and the different complements of vultures. So the conservationists could then focus their efforts uh, in, in areas that are good uh, for vultures to look after them. And then just to end really, um, You've got species like Shikra, which are tiny. They uh, only occupy about three square kilometers. You've got <clears throat> a huge range. And then you contrast that with the forest buzzard, which has got a contracted range and, and a larger area requirement. So if we plot the seven most, uh, the seven species with the most habitat and the seven species with the least habitat, this is what you've got. Uh, the, the small chikras and everything, two or three million pairs could theoretically be accommodated across the whole of their African range. Whereas down the bottom there, those scops owls on the islands, only 200 pairs. So what we're trying to do with the data is just make it more accurate. So we're not guessing at numbers and, uh, and, and hopefully you can all join in at some stage. Uh, if you want to take part in GRIN, uh, go to globalraptors.org, and that's got all the details on the mobile apps in Android and iOS. And if you want to see the work that we've done so far, it's all available at the habitatinfo.com uh, ARTB atlas. It's a great opportunity to be able to present on a favorite topic to you all. And, uh, and I hope that these projects are helping us understand the birds a little bit better. With that, I'll sign off. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Rob. That's um, that's an amazing amount of information. And uh, I love the the GIS renderings there. They're fantastic to show us exactly what's happening in Africa with the with the different birds. So thank you so much for that. And thank you for sharing that info um, of the app as well. We're, uh, we're definitely, I'm pretty sure I can already see some questions coming through uh, about the app. We're going to discuss that uh, at the end of the session with you. So stay, stick around. Uh, we're definitely going to have a lot of questions for you. Uh, with that, we're going to head all the way out to Nigeria to visit uh, jo Josiah to speak a little bit more about... Youth conservation. Good evening, everyone. My name is Josiah Ibrahim, a research associate at the APL Adventist Ornithological Research Institute, 
here in Jos, Nigeria. I'm also a PhD student. Um, I'm here to inspire young Nigerians, young Africans on the need to get involved in the conservation of raptors. I believe what I'm going to say here will actually convince you to see the need and the importance of getting involved in raptors. Research. Today I will be talking to you on the topic titled Empowering Tomorrow's Guidance of the Sky where I'm going to share some of my experiences from the Yellow Bee Kite projects and the Weber Seagull projects that can actually inspire you to see the importance and also the needs to get involved in the raptor research. One of the stories I promised to tell you about is the Yellow Bee Kite projects which we are looking at the movement ecology of the Yellow Bee Kites within Sub-Saharan Africa. And of course, what we needed to do is how to get the kites. In our mind, we want to catch the kites. And we know scientific method on how to catch these kites. And one of it is the use of mist nets, which we actually monitor where they are breeding or where they are foraging. We mount our mist nets and we use, we employ the use of a bait. The bait, the bait that we normally we used was we, we used domestic chicken and of course it wasn't successful and also we constructed a wooden trap with it was which which was fed in with carcasses which we collected from the abattoirs of course it wasn't successful another one that was a little bit successful was the the one that we have to use the juveniles and of course we have to go in rounds where those birds are actually breeding we have to monitor where they are breeding where there are a lot of activities search for nests use <coughs> Climb on top of the trees, check what is the condition of the nest. Is it actually is it is it at the, is it at the egg laying stage? Is it at the construction level stage? Then we record all those information, which later on we are going to come back to it and also look at the condition of the nest. Of course, after scouting for the nest nesting site, which we, we, we located quite a good number. So um the next thing was what we did was we actually monitor to see if the nest is actually active means if it is actually at the building stage, um, if it is act if there are eggs inside, if there it's actually the, the, the birds are incubating. So we monitor those nests until when it hatches, and after it hatches, we monitor this, the, 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 the fledglings to from first week from week one to week four. At that stage, they are fully they, they are fully feathered. They have already put on the, like like good feathers that we can be able to actually mount the secret transmitters on them. How can we get them involved through education? For instance, April Adventist Ornithological Research Institute, which is the famous ornithological research institute in West Africa, they give opportunities for young Africans, young people to come and study raptors and of course they give give scholarship master scholarship for you to become a good conservationist and also how can we how can we how can we also involve those people that are not actually been in uploading of course throughout my research work anywhere i go to people come around and ask me just say what are you doing with birds I always explain to them that birds are actually good by indicators of our environment. We use birds as models. I encourage you guys, come and join me. Let us involve in the conservation of these raptors. Of course, like, 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 like the owls. Owls are another raptors that people they have different beliefs in them. I try to encourage you Nigerians to get involved in the study of raptors. I go to secondary schools around the Amuru forests. I also preach about how to give, how to involve in the research of raptors. I also, how can we, these young people, they need to be celebrated. And here is Juan, who is the current winner of the Raptor Research Grant that she's studying her master's here in Aplori, in, in, in April 11th, on ecological reserve. You see, this is how we encourage people, and this is how we celebrate her. We celebrated Juan for winning that grant. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Joan Banda from Zimbabwe. I'm a current master's student at the AP Leventis Ornithological Research Institute in Nigeria. 
I was very excited recently to be awarded the African Red Raptor Leadership Grant. Um, and everyone at the institute was so excited with the work that we put in and the results that we got. I was very excited about how this all worked out. My second experience I want to share with us is the the first breeding record of the Wellbacks Eagle here in Amuro Forest Reserve, which I think is the first one in West Africa. And it began when we noticed that the Wellbacks Seafood is actually breeding in our reserve. And we actually employ monitoring. We monitor the breeding periods. We're looking at what time they come in, are they actually breeding until it hatches. And of course, within that time, we actually make an attempt to trap the adult, which we constructed a trap. We also, we also use a bait, which is a domestic chicken on it, and it wasn't successful. Until when this bird hatches. So when it hatches, we actually monitor, we actually keep, we keep monitoring the juvenile. Until when one day the juvenile fell down from the tree and the nest actually scattered. So we actually went in there, we looked for the juvenile, we removed it, and we found out that it has a small injury on its wing. Of course, as an ontologist, we have to take it to the area and take care of it. We actually took care of it until when it actually recovered fully. While it was in the aviary, we normally feed it with, uh, with rodents, which we actually believe this is the food that uh, the, 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 the adult actually fed it with. Of course, while doing that, we actually noticed that in the sky, like I said, the guardians of the sky, the guardians of the sky were actually hovering, moving, coming down to the same tree from time to time. We constructed an, a, a basket that resembled the nest and we actually took that juvenile back to the nest and we actually continued to monitor the juvenile. Continue to monitor the juvenile until the parent actually come back and started feeding the juvenile. With this little PC story of mine, I know you're going to be inspired. Looking at a young person like me getting involved in this kind of research, I also want to talk to you out there to come out and uh, let's join hands and get involved in, the, in this research. Thank you for listening. Fantastic. Thank you, Josiah. I believe Josiah is actually in the audience tonight. So if you have any questions at all about his work um, in in Nigeria with those uh, yellow bull kites and youth conservation, I'm sure he would be more than happy uh, to share uh, some of that info with us. Uh, next up, we're heading all the way to East Africa to join Simon Thompson uh, with, uh, on another one of his field trips into African uh, East African raptors. The savannas and grasslands are the typical tourist destinations whereby not only the tourists can see their intended prey, so can the birds of prey and it really does matter that they can visually see and locate their prey. And some of these species would include the battle eagle, the secretary bird, the black winged kite, barn owls, grass owls, the vultures of course, as it would be feeding on the historically vast plains filled with wildebeest and zebra, and they would include the rappels, the white bag, the white-headed, the hooded, as well as in southern Africa, the cape vultures. And they occur also side by side during the winter period with an enormous number of European and Asian migrants, such as the steppe eagle, steppe buzzard, honey buzzard, and more falcon, lesser kestrels, all of which will use the enormity of prey abundance especially during and shortly after the rains. And the role of termites cannot be underestimated. They really do serve an incredible buffet for all of the birds, especially the migratory raptors. Many of the birds of prey that we get in Africa are migrants from abroad. Take, for example, the honey buzzard. It lives in the forests of Europe and Asia, migrates, comes down through some of the most driest, most barren landscapes of all, with the chances of finding wasps or bees or easily eaten 
food is zero and then gets into the moist savanna woodlands and forests of the equator it spends much of its year in a forest in the temperate world and then much of its year in the forests of equatorial Africa but it has to traverse massive open landscapes so you have a bird that is basically a forest adapted species or a woodland adapted species that is quite capable when required to fly over vast open landscapes The wetlands and the waterways of Africa have a particular group of raptors that prey only on fish. And they would include the African fish eagle, the osprey, which is a migrant, as well as the rather strange African fishing owls, which would include the pels, the rufous, and the vermiculated. Other habitats, more of a smaller microhabitat, would be places such as cliff faces. And there are a number of cliff nesting raptors that really do not or very rarely use other sites. And these would include obviously the large falcons such as the peregrine, lana, barbary falcon and titer falcon, all of which are restricted to nesting on cliff faces. Of eagles, you would have the Verro's eagle. Occasionally you'll get something like the African hawk eagle that will nest on a cliff site, but usually on a tree on a cliff site, but they like rugged topography. The scrublands of Acacia and Mopani are habitats to other species as well. And depending upon the size of the Acacia woodland and the Mopani, you get birds such as little sparrowhawks, shikras, Avampo sparrowhawks. And others even such as the crowned eagle yet again do quite well in those kind of woodlands depending upon how thick they are. The more open woodlands would be identified by species such as the martial eagle, tawny eagle, African hawk eagle. Modern Africa has another new novel landscape, and that is one that is human dominated. This isn't the end of the world for birds of prey, some of which are actually quite able to survive in large numbers. For example, a yellow-billed kite is typically known for nesting within the cities and towns all across East Africa. Other birds of prey that you will commonly see within the suburban and urban areas of Eastern Africa are the black sparrowhawk, the African goshawk, the harrier hawk, and even, oddly, the air's hawk eagle. One tree in particular stands out as being its favorite nesting substrate, and that would be the eucalyptus. Planted many years ago, and some of them reaching over 40 meters in height, they remain absolutely inclimbable and extremely safe and secure nest sites for a large number of birds of prey. Of course, in Durban, one gets the urban nesting crowned eagles, and that somehow puts a different connotation on the status of crowned eagles, where people seem to imagine that that species can do quite well in a city. Well, it can do well in a city that's well wooded and with a population that is highly tolerant. However, most of Africa doesn't resemble that in the least. Other species that do quite well in human landscapes used to be the peregrine. And we used to get peregrines in the cities of Arusha, Moshi, Dar es Salaam, and in the city of Nairobi and also Eldoret. Other birds of prey seen within city boundaries would also include the barn owl. Uh, it's doing quite well, evidently in warehouses and even in the busy nightclubs of Nairobi. There are a number of species which one associates with livestock pastures and croplands. And here in the highlands of eastern Africa, the auger buzzard is by far the most characteristic, followed closely by the long-crested eagle. In southern Africa, it's probably the same, with the jackal buzzard taking place of the auger buzzard. Other human landscapes would include large cereal farms. And it would appear from many of the road camps that the large cereal farms of eastern Africa are now devoid of most birds of prey. Not long ago, 
When it came to harvest, one would see an enormity of large falcons in particular, such as lanners and peregrines, coming down in front of combine harvesters, catching the quail and the birds as they run, tawny eagles, African hawk eagles chasing after the hares, being disturbed by the combine harvesters. But for the last 20 odd years, that has not been the case. It has almost been absolutely empty, the skies of any bird of prey during the harvest period. And it also goes holds true for the small birds and the rodents and the hares that were formerly extremely common in the wheat fields and the cereal growing vast landscapes that now surround much of our protected areas. From the road counts, it's increasingly clear that the protected areas of Africa are absolutely essential for the conservation of raptors today. We do not have the same situation as they would do in North America or Europe whereby common land can have an enormity of birds of prey, where farmland can also have a very, very robust population of birds of prey. It may be different in southern parts of Africa or in other parts where the human density or the human impact on the environment isn't so clear, but we as biologists are extremely concerned that our raptors are in such catastrophic decline in areas where there is high human land use and it doesn't have to be humans and raptors can live at high densities amicably fantastic uh thank you again simon and the team at chase green africa for another phenomenal field trip um they're so well well formed and they they're just they they really are inspirational and remind us what africa has to offer uh when it comes to these birds of prey so that is uh that is our field trip done um and as i said down to my uh, favorite part of of the evening and that's chatting to our audience members it's always great to hear your stories and your questions um i believe rob is still in the yeah there he there he is rob's still there um and josiah is also around i saw him pop up a little while ago um so if you have any questions at all um for for these uh these amazing speakers please um, either unmute yourself. You're welcome to unmute yourself and ask your question that way, or you can even type a question in the chat box. Um, I see there is, or there was one question in the chat. Does the app from non Nonkululeko, does the app also tell us about the conservation status of the birds and how often um, is this data updated? So I'm assuming that is for Rob. And I see Rob already commented. <laughs> Rob, would you like to uh, would you like to expand on that at all? Thanks, Kaylin. No, it's just a it's a really great idea, and uh, yeah, it's it's an obvious way of us relaying information back. At the moment, uh, the phone has just been engineered as sort of one way traffic to go from the phone to the database. Uh, but yeah, it's easily possible to. Uh, send the data back the other way um, with a bit more development. So I think that's a great idea. And um, <clears throat> we've linked it. We've got a global raptor names table that's linked to IUCN uh, status. So, uh, yeah, I think that's a super idea. And we'll, yeah, I think we better get on with that one. <laughs> and how often is this data actually updated? Is it, is it, live as people input the data or no i mean the, what we needed kaylin was a a system that would work offline because obviously uh people are traveling all over africa and i know the network's pretty good now but uh, there were always going to be places where they'd have to record without mobile network so <clears throat> yeah we've uh developed the app to work offline um, but then as soon as you're on a decent connection, uh, you just press a button and it all uploads to the database. Um, and uh, yeah, do that as often as possible, especially if you're recording surveys. Um, but we tried to make the app work sort of behind the scenes to make everything really easy. So uh, you start a survey and you can just forget about your phone. It's, it's gonna record 
your movements, your effort uh, on that particular survey. Um, and then there will be uh, waypoints that will need to be uploaded afterwards. So do that often rather than uh, once a year. Fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> I see, Holly, uh, you've got your hand raised. Good to see you again. Uh, thank you, Rob. That was a fantastic presentation. And I ask a question because I know we have all sorts of students in the room here from all over Africa. And it would be great if people in the audience could just write their country in the chat so that we can have a good idea where you're from. But Rob, you're obviously collecting all of this data. And as Josiah said, I mean, certainly at Uplori Institute in, in Nigeria, there's, you know, 10 students a year going through there. Yeah. All of this data that you collect, are there places for students to be able to write into you to be able to do masters on this data to try and get answers to questions that you're looking for? Or how do you interact with students around the world? Yeah, um, it's a question to pose to the Peregrine Fund now, because um, we've handed over the sort of data reporting uh, to them. And so Chris McClure, uh, the guy in the photo there with Rick Watson, uh, he's handling all of that really capably and Leah Dunn at the Peregrine Fund. So yeah, the data does become available um, as long as people want their data to go out because some people are, are quite protective or they believe it's sensitive and so on. So you can mark your data as confidential and then it will only get used by Peregrine Fund personnel for the good of the species and conservation. Um, but no, they have quite a few data requests and, um, and then scientific articles or publications can come out of that. Um, so yeah, it's a work in progress. And uh, I think it'd be wonderful if the group in Nigeria could use it. Uh, it's there to be used. Um, I don't know whether the Peregrine Fund actually suggests the questions at this stage. Uh, they've mainly been uh, marketing the app and getting it out there. And recently they've done some demonstrations in the Philippines and there's been a, a huge response from the Philippines um, wanting to use it. So uh, what we're trying to do is uh, develop the languages to make it easy for people in different parts of the world uh, to use it. Okay, and just to follow on questions, Rob, one would be in terms of for what reasons would people want to keep their data confidential? Obviously, remembering that a lot of people in the group here may not have even come across raptors. Yeah. And my second question actually comes from the number of people that we're getting here, South Africa, Kenya, Saudi Arabia, Nigeria, um, the Gambia, all sorts of places. Can you just tell us a little bit about the bottlenecks, as they call them, of migratory birds and some of the challenges they face at those bottlenecks? Sure. Um, <clears throat> the sort of reasons why people might want the data to be confidential is if it's a nest site uh, that they're recording that they believe to be sensitive. Um, what we do with the public side of the databases, we only show uh, non-breeding records. Um, and then there's a list of species that we feel are sensitive. Uh, so a lot of the falcons, all of the vultures, um, the recent records have been withheld uh, from the public view. Um, and people might also want it to be confidential if it's their home and they, they want to remain private. Um, so, yeah, that's the sort of reason. Um, but the majority of people want their data to be used and will share it uh, for the, you know, the good of conservation and so on. Um, so that's the confidentiality side and it's all handled in a, a data agreement and so on. Um, the bottlenecks, yeah, it is. It's a massive worry and it's been a, a project of mine. Really, when I was with the Hawk and Owl Trust, we went out to Malta and we worked with BirdLife Malta to try and stop the killing of birds of prey on their migratory bottlenecks there. 
Um, in parts of the Mediterranean, the situation is much improved. Uh, Italy is much improved, Spain is much improved, um, and the Eastern Mediter Mediterranean is a, a bit of a hot spot, uh, and Malta is still a hot spot. So it's not resolved. Um, it's a weak point in what we're doing because, you know, we work so hard to conserve 16 pairs of honey buzzards in Wales, and uh, 5,000 get shot annually in Malta. So it's it's ridiculous. Um, and you work so hard in Africa to conserve the birds when they're there. Um, and there's a bit of passing the buck. Uh, you know, people say, oh, the problem's not here. It's with pesticides in Africa or the problems at the breeding sites and so on. But actually, you know, we all really need to pull together and, uh, and work with these bottleneck areas like Malta to, to solve it. Um, but uh, Malta is sort of viewed by some conservationists as a bit intractable, um, but I don't think that's a reason to give up. I think you've just got to keep keep working on them. Um, does that answer Maybe it? Maybe we that... should. Yeah. It does, Rob, but I'm going to give a bit of a tongue-in-cheek comment here because I don't know if you know, but in the 70s, Malta gave a lot of free scholarships to African students. And as a result, if you're a Maltese citizen, you get a lot of free visas across Africa. So maybe as the African people, we need to withdraw those free visas and say, until you stop killing our birds, yeah. you can't come in our countries. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, I think it is time for hardball. And uh, yeah, I think a lot of um, UK conservationists were hoping that e the EU membership would solve it. Um, but I was a bit skeptical of that. And no, it hasn't solved it. So um, yeah, it, it's difficult to apply the pressure on, on the political situation in Malta because the hunters are very dominant in the politics and uh, it's split down the middle between two political parties. And uh, they, yeah, they, they, uh, they are very averse from you know, really solving it because they lose so many votes when they do that. So uh, yeah, it's a difficult one, but it's it's got to be done. And uh, yeah, I think there's social mechanisms one day, um, yeah, that maybe we'll find the way. But I was so frustrated by it. Uh, there's a great social psychologist. I remember reading his book, Elliot Aronson on the social animal. And uh, it made so much sense what he was saying. And I thought, I wonder what he would make of this. So I tracked him down to University of San Diego and Jay's uh, still going down there. And I said, come on, you know, uh, Elliot, there must be a solution to this. And uh, he said, give up now. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, but no, we can't give up now. We have to just keep working away at it. And uh, yeah, um, I'm sure we'll get there in the end whether it comes through, you know, the younger generation or whatever, but BirdLife Malta have been great at bringing in the younger generation and, and changing attitudes there. Thank you very much, Rob. And maybe all of you Aplori students, when you graduate, you can go and open an Aplori in Malta and make the difference. Yeah, that would be amazing. Yeah, I think that's that's the the common thread, right? Uh, politics and conservation. It's uh, it's always going to be a very difficult line to walk. So um, yeah, yeah, it's it's and then it's across the board, all species, right? So um, absolutely, definitely, yeah. definitely a difficult situation, which I'm sure we can sit for hours and debate. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. I see a hand uh, up from Brian. Brian, good to see you again. Hi, Kellen. Thank you. And I'm happy to see you. And always happy to be in this platform. <laughs> now, I have a question, Rob. Uh, when you talk of uh, data confidentiality, I'm really, uh, I really want to know at what point do we draw the line? Uh, for instance, if I'm doing a study of, I'd say maybe some breeding sites, and uh, then after getting the data, up to what point do I consider data confidential? Do I need to share it, say, with the 
community conserve, I mean, conservancy managers, or do I need it for instance, I'm in Kenya. So do I need to just have it with a Kenya wireless service and that is it? Second question to that, uh, I know I asked this question at some point in this podium as well, but I'm still really not finding an answer. Some relationship with the vulture nest and the bees. I'm really uh, worried or rather want to know if at all, it could be one of the threats to the breeding sites of vultures. Because I've seen some nests after the breeding seasons, uh, I'd find nest having bees underneath. So I'm having questions if that could be a symbiotic kind of relationship where it's just mutual or rather it could be one of those threats. Thank you. Oh, well, thanks, Brian. Those are good questions and uh, I'll try my best to answer them. Um, going back to the confidentiality again, um, I, I hope very much that uh, it, you can put it into the hands of the Peregrine Fund uh, with your data. Um, your data will be safe with them. Uh, we've got security implemented on the database so that breeding sites are not shown to the public. Sensitive species are not shown to the public. So I would hope that you don't have to worry too much about that. Um, it's only if you've got other reasons why you would want to keep it confidential that you would mark the records as confidential. Most people don't. Most people allow the Peregrine Fund to use the data as they see fit. Um, another thing I ought to mention, because some people are nervous that their data then gets used by other researchers um, and that can cause problems. So uh, the Peregrine Fund have a policy, um, which is that if you own more than 10% of the data, um, you should be given an authorship on any articles uh, that emanate uh, from that data. So if someone's analyzing the data, for instance. So they're still finding their way with this. It's all uh, early days for them, but uh, your data should be held and managed responsibly enough by them. Uh, I hope for you not to have these worries. Um, but uh, yeah, and then bees and vultures. I, I, I haven't actually come across that uh, phenomenon before. Um, it doesn't surprise me that both would occur in the same area um, because I guess under the crances and the cliffs, uh, they're crevices for the, that the bees are using and that the vultures are using. Um, so it might be a coincidence that they're both just using the cliffs. I haven't heard of bees actually killing vultures, but I suppose that could happen. Um, so uh, it's an area that I haven't I haven't come across any information on, Brian. But uh, maybe Simon would have ideas on that as well because he's got such an extensive field experience. Uh, he might have seen something there. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I don't think Simon's in the room today, but he will be here next week for sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so yes, Brian, I think, uh, I remember you asking that question once uh, before. So I think, um, come join us again next week and let's see if Simon has um a little bit of information on that um i know i personally also have not actually come across bees under any raptor uh, raptor nest but but there's no reason why they wouldn't be in those same areas especially in uh, mountain mountainous areas where there are those cliffs and crances where where the bees will settle in um so yeah bring that question again next week i think uh, simon will definitely have something uh, to add to that I I do remember Brian having a conversation with Simon about this whole movement in the, um, you know, wildlife economy of 
of bees and honey. And of course, birds of prey needs need trees to nest in, but the beehives also need to be in trees. And so there's a massive push across Africa to get people earning money off honey. And of course, most of the honey, even though we discourage it, is smoked out. And so therefore that smoke is affecting any if that nest is active, if the nest is not active, you know, somebody has to climb up that tree to smoke out those bees and the bees can become aggressive. But again, you know, Simon wasn't specifically, um, I think it's still a question for Simon, although the other thing he did say is we have this synanthropic wildlife problem here where in so many areas, we've got an increase in species such as baboons and hyenas. But if we take baboons specifically, you know, they want to get away from predators. So they're climbing up these trees and very often they're raiding the nests of birds of prey. And so, for example, Simon will talk to you about, you know, um, auger buzzard nests that have only been able to be successful once in eight years simply because of the baboons raiding them and since he has razor wired the bottom of the tree which he will talk about now the baboons cannot get up into there they're raising a young every year but of course if you've got beehives in the tree the baboons are not going to go up there so in one way you're distracting the baboons or, or keeping them away from the tree so a raptor can have a safe tree to make a nest but at the same time, if there's a lot of activity in that in that beehive with people, then the raptor's unlikely to make a nest there. I mean, Rob or, or Kaylin, do you want to come in more on that? Rob, you want to give it a go? <clears throat> um, well, I know that uh, they're, they're using bees for management of elephants as well, aren't they? So, uh, yeah. It's all quite involved, um, uh, amazing animals. So it's great to get the benefits from bees. Um, you're so lucky to have so many bees because in the UK, bees are declining so badly uh, from the pesticides. So it's it's an amazing natural asset um, as long as they're not, you know, killing things, causing problems. So, uh, no, I don't have anything further to add other than that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I hope that there are synergies uh, to be found. And that's great what Simon's doing, protecting uh, the, the birds. We, we had quite a few nests, uh, the black eagles. And um, I always used to think, that having their alternate nests was a sign of success that a pair with five nests was a good sign, but it's actually a bad sign. Um, the most successful pairs only had one nest and uh, the pairs on the lower escarpment, which were accessible by baboons, uh, were very poor breeders. So even, you know, the Vera's eagles suffer from the baboon predation. Uh, but yeah, I suppose that's a part of nature. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, I think well, uh, from my <laughs> side, um, in terms of so baboons, yeah, definitely uh, have been have been an, uh, have impacted many different species of raptors, uh, and a little bit of 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 self um, marketing here. They, I did do a paper on the Varroa's e baboons and Varroa's eagles in the Machalisberg, and we did find, you know, we had we had nests being disturbed by baboons in certain areas so uh, the baboon you know if there's a lot of uh, anthropogenic activity that 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 favor baboons so if, if there's a lot of farming going in the area where baboons or even urban areas that are, are producing a lot of food for baboons there'll be a higher density of baboons and these baboons tend to at least with with cliff nesting raptors they share the same um, resource they share those cliffs as as a refuse uh, and, and often that leads to competition between the two the two species uh, and and you'll have that that displacement in certain cases with raptors and we found that in the Mkhalisberg where where the baboons would chase uh, young birds off the nest or, or, or raid the nest uh, if the bird is is old enough to 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 get away they'd jump to a, a, a higher vantage point but there is that interaction uh, in terms of the bees we know that that East Africa, I believe, is is the, the the largest honey producer in in Africa, and so there is definitely a, a, 
potential to use that for conservation. Um, but yeah, there's going to be there's going to be um, trade-offs if 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 people want to climb that tree to get that honey, uh, and there is a, a a raptor in that in that nest. It's going to disturb them. Smoking, I mean, using smoke for bees—that's that's a normal practice. But yeah, it's going to have that impact on on raptors as well. But definitely, I think um, Simon will will be able to to add to this this conversation. It's a very interesting conver conversation. In fact, I I don't think I've ever heard of any uh, research that's gone into. I mean, there's there's very few few um, observations of 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 bees that I've heard of in in raptor nests, um, and and so there's not a lot of research I don't think, or at least that I've I've heard of, that's dedicated to that in particular. I I do know we have an upcoming speaker who's got a story about a raptor who specifically does he pick wasps or spiders out to build his nest with Rob? I I surely you must know this. Some sort of hawk that goes and specifically collects, I think it might be spider webs to put in his nest. Yes. Yes. I think it's scared by goshawk, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yes. It's yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they do. They festoon their nest with uh, cobwebs. So uh, pretty unusual behavior. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah. They do interesting things. And mm. uh yeah, they don't always read the books, so raptors, you know, within a species, you know, they, you get such variation. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that, they keep us guessing. <laughs> they do. And Brian, I just wanted to add one thing further with, with baboons and Kaylin is that we're seeing, you know, an upsurge in, well, maybe not in South Africa for you South Africans, for electricity and the pylons. And of course, the pylons provide a safe roosting site for baboons away from predators. So they are able to increase in numbers in places where predators can't reach them. And that means they have a larger impact. But again, I'm sure Simon will tell us more about that. That's everything from me, Kaylin. Awesome. Well, we've got a question here from Cello, uh, Cello from TUT, one of our TUT students, I see. Um the question is, which conservation efforts are taken to protect the birds? For example, we know that if you're found in possession of a lion's head without the necessary permits, you'll be fined or arrested. So what happens when one uh, one is in possession of the birds illegally? Um, so whether it's a vulture or an eagle. Rob, would you like to give that a go? Uh, yeah, I'm a, yeah, I'm, I'm muted. Um, yeah. So uh, CITES is responsible for protection of uh, birds of prey and uh, captive birds of prey. Um, CITES is the best source of information for this, but I think it will depend on what country you're in, um, what permits you will need, uh, but you probably need a permit to hold in captivity a particular raptor and maybe also you need a permit to transport a raptor as well uh, that was the case in South Africa when I was there um, here in the UK it's a little bit looser there are a lot of birds of prey in captivity I'd much rather see less um, there's uh, quite a strong sort of falconry community in the UK many of whom are really good at what they do. Um, but there are probably so many birds of prey kept now that shouldn't be kept under certain conditions. So people need to know how to look after these birds before having them in, in captivity. Yeah, and I think what I'll add from that, Silo, uh, especially here in South Africa, we have very strict um, legislation when it comes to illegally obtaining an indigenous species and that that goes for your um your birds of prey as well there's certain uh, birds of prey that are actually listed as what we call top species threatened or protection species that that enjoy further more stricter legislation as well um so yes if you are caught with with um one of these species without the required permits and things like that, you will, you do face very stiff fines, very, uh, very um, serious jail time in certain cases. But the the trick is catching the people, right? It's not always as easy as um, just walking around and seeing someone with that type of animal. Um, in terms of, 
yeah, I think that that's probably sums it up um, from the side. Dylan, maybe we can put that question as well to Josiah because coming from Nigeria, there's a whole other setup there. So Josiah, maybe you could uh, come in there. Josiah, are you with us? I have audio. Hello. Uh, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Hey, Josiah, um, good to hear from you. Uh, honestly, it's actually different when it comes to uh, this part of the world, which is Nigeria. I can remember there was a story of a, of a, of a guy from uh, from Nigeria. Okay, they called uh, April Adventist on Ethological Research Institute that there was a kite. Um, that the guy is playing with the kites in the market, that uh, he wants to sell the kite. I say, what? Do you want to sell the kite? For what reason? Hmm. I tried to talk to the guy nicely for him to just release the kite, let it go. Uh, at first, I asked him, where did he got the kite? He says, actually, monitor a nest from the beginning. When he noticed that it was breeding, he monitored the nest and removed the, the fledgling from the nest, and he raised the fledgling to the extent that he can be able to like, okay, uh, make it as a pet. I say, okay, can you just release it? Say, no, I have to pay you. I say, okay, now, um, I have to report to the National Park Authority to tell them that this is what's happening. Of course, there are laws binding this thing. All these things are prohibited in this country, but then people tend to look at it as if, because you're studying birds, uh, there's, there's a big price behind it. I told you, no, you have to release this, but or else I'll get the police for you. At the end of the day, the guy stops picking my calls. I don't even know where he is. I don't know what what happens with the bird. But what I'm trying to say here is that, of course, there are laws guiding that. But the issue is that how can you get the people doing that? And the moment you try to show them that there's, 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 there's a penalty behind that, they stop doing what they're doing. Hmm. Yeah, okay. it's certainly a whole nother thing it's there. More um, yeah, we got you, Josiah. I just wanted to ask another question, Kaylin. Sorry to come mm -hmm. in again while Josiah's on the line about this breeding pair of Warburg eagle in Amarun Forest. Amarun being the rehabilitated forest area around the AP Leventis Ornithological Institute. Josiah, have the Warburg eagle ever come back? Have they returned or, or has it only been that one record? Uh, so uh, for the breeding, um, adults have, like, the, for the... And so we did that project 2020. 2021, adults came back again. Still, this year they are still around, hovering around, but they haven't used the nest any, uh, any longer. So we suspect that probably they're still breeding around the, around the reserve because we always see them hovering around. Hmm. Fantastic. Thank you, Josiah. That's everything from me, Kaylin. Awesome. Uh, we got another question from Walter. Um, what should we do to avoid birds from landing on the electric wires, including the poles? Uh, a scenario I witnessed when a black kite landed on an electric pole and the bird's wing was electrified with, uh, and within 10 minutes, the bird was dead. Uh, Rob, would you like to weigh in on this? Sure. Um I'm probably a bit out of touch with what's happening with um, local electricity companies in Kenya or South Africa now. Uh, but in my day in South Africa, ESCOM was really proactive about getting out there. We had to identify the lines that were going through raptor rich habitats. Um, it would be a great use of the ARDB data to do that now um, and just flag up these areas where raptors are really vulnerable to electrocution. And the solution then uh, was these raptor protectors, because often it was, I think, the 11 kilovolt um, uh, lines with the three insulation insulators pointing upwards that were killing the birds. And uh, the protection then was a bit of plastic that would cover uh, one or more of those insulators. Um, and I remember Eagle Star Insurance produced a whole load of them. It was it was great. So I don't know what's happening now. You'd have to ask Andre Botter 
uh, from EWT for an update on the South African situation. Uh, maybe Simon will be able to talk about it next week for Kenya. I know it's a big, big problem uh, all over the world. Um, so, yeah, raptors face all these terrible threats. Um, and uh, we've just got to hope that they can keep going uh, and we've got to mitigate and deal with these threats as much as we can. So um, I'd say have a chat with the electrical company in your area and try and find out what they're doing and try and urge them to do something about it. So just before, um, Jose, I just want to say that Kenya is at a, at a critical state, but I just want to say it was in the news today that Ethiopia is now working with BirdLife to retrofit poles. Now, this is the first for East Africa because we've lost, I mean, Simon was telling me 90% of our auger buzzers are gone now. And we are at a state where they are asking us to count the dead bodies under the lines because they need numbers to know how many are gone. But that doesn't make sense. We need to count the remaining birds in the sky to show where they've disappeared because obviously all the dead ones are eaten by stray dogs, moved by kids, mongooses, everything else. So, Rob, I think this is a conversation definitely for you and Simon. He's like a dog with a bone at the moment over it. And I'm going to stop right there. Yeah, definitely. You know, in South Africa, uh, as as Rob mentioned, EWT does a lot of work with um electric uh, with ESCOM, our power power utility, um, to bird safe all their lines. Um, the first step many years ago was to start doing away with what we refer to as kite structures. It's the old um the old structure or old build of of the electric poles, which helped the situation. Now, um. When you, when you in in South Africa, when you when you um, witness a bird uh, electrocution, you report the poll number. Each poll has a number, um, a, a little tag on it. You report that tag, and they have committed uh, that within, I believe, four days of reporting that uh, that electrocution, a team will be on site to assess the pole and assess the structure and put up uh, what they refer to as bird flappers, uh, where they need to, um, but that will. Um, kind of um, scare birds away from that particular line or if needs be retrofit, uh, change the entire structure itself. So there are different um, processes. The The catch being we have to see an electrocution to report the problem and report the pole, which um, which is a bit of a problem. But there are, there are um, efforts uh, ongoing efforts to try and identify these these problem areas. Uh, regions in particular, but also problem poles um, ahead of time. So uh, yeah, I hope that uh, that answers uh, your your question. I see Josiah has his hand up. Uh, Josiah, would you like to weigh in on that? Okay, um, mine is a question to Rob regarding regarding the app. So um, Rob is part of the the work that we're doing with the kite here in Nigeria. Is uh, we're also trying to look at. Uh, uh, to monitor the nests of this kite and to look at what is happening, like the nesting materials they use. Because um, during our surveys, we had an issue with one of the kites. I think some of the materials they used to build the nest, including plastics, and unfortunately, one of the plastic injured the birds in the nest. So um, uh, for the app, do you think uh, is possible that the app can be able to give us uh, something meaningful that that is uh that is connected to that and uh second question with the app is that okay i i learned that you are trying to translate the app into different languages and um i was once involved in the in the development of an app african bed app uh by african bed club um which uh, we translated the language to hausa language hausa language is one of the common languages that are spoken going across uh, we are house a lot so do you think it's possible to translate that up to that language thanks Josiah <clears throat> great and uh, enjoyed hearing all about the kites and uh, your work and uh, yeah that's 
that's a great shame to hear about the injury caused by the plastic. Um, going back to the electrocution, uh, we've uh, made the app uh, capable of recording electrocutions. Uh, you can also record nesting details um, and you can record mortalities. And so, yeah, it's a great way of uh, keeping a record of what's happening. Uh, you could include for electrocutions uh, the number of the pole and stuff like that. So it is it's a logging device that could be used, Josiah, for nest problems or electrocutions or whatever. Um, and then at least we people will know the data will be in the database and it gives us a reference uh, and then people can act on that. Um, and then the language, uh, I heard most of what you were saying and you're interested in a new in a new language uh, for Nigeria. Uh, that would be wonderful. I think it's something to suggest to the Peregrine Fund. Um, so we can maybe correspond about that and uh, and see if the Peregrine Fund can include another language. Um, so it would be great to get good coverage there. Um, yeah, and then, oh, the other thing I thought I'd mention is I know Munir Varani now is, uh, he's also very involved with electrocutions of raptors and, and fixing the problems. Uh, in Mongolia and other places. And I believe there is an app uh, that is expressly designed for just recording electrocutions. Um, uh, otherwise we were gonna do it with uh, with the, uh, the Grin app, but there is a dedicated app for that. Um, I don't know anything more about it. I haven't used it yet, but- um, I was about to post it in the chat, Rob, and every single access it's telling me is forbidden. So it must be down at the moment. Oh, okay. All right. Good, but Munir would be our contact to find out a bit more about that. So I, I hope that helps and I hope that answers your questions, Josiah. Perfect. Yeah, Josiah is nodding. Thanks, Josiah. Um, I see Brian has his hand up again. Uh, do you have another question there, Brian? Yes, uh, another question here. Now, this is about uh, uh, breeding success monitoring in uh, raptors. I, I do know there is the element of intrusive and then the non-intrusive monitoring. Now, then, now, uh, considering the conservation status of these birds, we do not want to uh, disrupt or disturb them in the nest. So I'm thinking of which method would be best for monitoring the breeding success, that is from egg laying to hatching, and just to see, how successful is it in a nest? I've been thinking of using, I mean, the technology of drones, but then some extent, I also think that could be also causing disturbance in the nest. So Rob, could you be having a better uh, way to study the breeding success in the nest? Thank you. Thanks. Brian, yes, I, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, drones are a new technology. Uh, we weren't uh, blessed with drones back in my day and I used the old fashioned telescope uh, from a distance. And uh, in many cases, I couldn't see into the nests uh, to get the number of eggs and I'd have to uh, figure it all out by just watching them over time from a distance. Um, the most difficult thing for me was always a negative result when I was studying eagles. It's very easy, you visit a nest, uh, you see the birds there, if there's a young bird in the nest or whatever, it's, it's wonderful, you get, you get a record of what's going on. And if you're far enough away, uh, the disturbance can be minimal. The problem is when you go to the nest and there's no sign of anything, 
and and then you can never be 100 percent sure unless you go back and go back and go back and that's the uh, time consuming bit in nest monitoring from what i remember um but uh with fish eagles we also used mirror sticks uh you would put a mirror on top of some poles to get up to see what was in the fish eagle nest uh and that was a good way um the birds will tolerate a certain amount of disturbance as long as you're not at the nest site or keeping them off eggs for a long period of time so uh, you need to restrict your nest visit if you're going close to it to less than an hour. Um, that's what I've always used. Um, and uh, and then you're not going to get the problems of chilling eggs and so on. Um, but if you go in, observe what's there and go out uh, once every two weeks or something like that, um, the impact should not be too bad. Um, so drones, uh, I think that's a, a new technology. I haven't had a lot of experience with them. Um, all I'd say is that it should it should theoretically be very useful, uh, but I know some raptors don't like drones and attack them. So you would have to use it with, uh, with care and uh, maybe observe from quite high up. And if, the birds are getting really aggressive and attacking the drone, then stop using it for that nest. Uh, so that's the sort of practical advice I would give, but uh, over to you, Colleen, and, and the, anyone else who wants to comment on, on new, new techniques for monitoring these birds. Yeah, um, so drones, they, ha they have been used, uh, but again, as Rob said, certain species are, are more... Um, tolerant of drones than others um, but camera traps we've used camera traps very successfully um, a lot of these larger raptors utilize the, the same nest year after year so if you put up a good quality camera trap uh, on that nest you'll have years worth of um, of data on breeding success um, a lot of these newer uh, camera traps could actually send you an email so you have a, a sim card in that in that um, in that camera trap so when it takes you and you can set it to either take on movement or it can take every few minutes or few hours and you can do this remotely with the new with the newer mon uh, models um Sometimes uh, there's also researchers that have attached these camera traps to DVRs. So a wire running down the nest tree or, or, or down the, the cliff face to a DVR machine um, and it downloads onto that. So you never actually have to, after attaching the, the camera, you never have to go back to that nest. You don't have to, to, to disturb the birds on the, on, on the nest while you're still getting constant uh, data from that camera. So those, those, those seem to work pretty well um, in, in many different applications. Perfect. Um, I think. Can I just are... add one thing to that, Kellen, just because yes. I think, um, what we are lacking in Africa, and Rob, you can feed into this, and I think it, we really are going on a long time here. Brian, in Europe, you can order a nest cam on Amazon, and they even sell, you know, all the garden shops now, they sell little nest boxes for garden birds, not raptors, although I think people do get owl boxes in the garden centers, and they come with this tiny little nest cam, and it's really cheap, and it feeds onto your phone, and it's like the thing, everybody with their kids looks at who's who's nesting there and when the, who's coming to feed. And it's really increased the interaction with wildlife from afar. And I and I just think we're really lacking that in Africa because it would be phenomenal to be able to have that for school kids to look in on. Rob, I mean, you probably have those in your garden, don't you? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a um I've got a tawny owl box about yeah, 30 feet away from me here, where they've raised two clutches of tawny owls. Um, and I've got a little camera in it exactly as you described. And I've got live feed in our little art gallery so people can come in and see what the baby owls are up to and so on. Well, they can't this year because four gray squirrels evicted them. Uh, but uh, yeah, it is a wonderful tool and uh, it is affordable, I think, for you know 30 40 pounds you can get the camera um and uh 
for it to work with your phone though this is where you you can have limitations uh because it needs to be on a wi-fi or it needs to be on a on some sort of network connection so that's often the challenge and then power supply um so i've got some birds in aviaries here as well uh the peregrine that we're looking after and a goshawk and so on and i put cameras in there and uh so you've got a live feed uh, that puts power out and then the signal comes back. So those are cabled. Um, and it's just overcoming the challenges of uh, the connectivity, really. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'll have a think about it. And uh, if I uh, if I can get any more suggestions to you, I will. Um, because it'd be great, great to see it used more in Africa, definitely. Perfect. Excellent. I think with that, we are going to call it a night. Um, thank you all for joining us. Rob, uh, um, Josiah, you guys were fantastic. Thank you for your, your presentations. It was fantastic hearing from you uh, and meeting you both. Um, remember, Next week is going to be another really great talk. Uh, we've got Simon Topset speaking about the mega eagles of Africa, the big and scaries, right? Those those ones with those huge talons. So um, join us, uh, same place, same time, seven o'clock South African time. Um, and we'd love to see you all here. Have a great night. <laughs>